Good, uh, good morning. Thank you for the invitation. My presentation was prepared while I was uh, still board member two weeks ago. So I'm a little bit in the gray zone, you know. So in between a little bit, in the decompression, I would say, uh, period. So my, my remarks are based on uh, different work by the ECB staff, uh, Philip Hartmann and uh, Frank Smets, and also work by the team of uh, Massimo Rostagno. Where are you, Massimo, there? So thank you very much for the abundant literature you gave me. And so I will dry, try also to, to draw some of um, you know, the essence of um, the remarks also that have been done by Mario. By the way, I've, I, I broadly agree, Mario, with what you said before. So, uh, <laughs> so it's not really a coincidence. I think it's, uh, it's more than a coincidence. Um, so, so let me go through the, the very simple outline. The first is uh, section one and two basically go through the past 20 years. The idea, of course, is not to rewrite history. So uh, I ask a little bit for your understanding. Uh, sometimes I will be a bit more critical, I think, uh, going through the introductory statements of the ECB over the last 20 years. Uh, I will give you some of my reactions on that. But it's not the intention to criticize or to rewrite history. Uh, with hindsight, it's always easy to do. Uh, so I'm not going to do that, but to try to draw some of the lessons of there. The, second, the third section that you see here, I think, fits very well with uh, actually was the, the concluding remarks of Mario, but also Olivier, Olivier uh, yesterday evening, is macroeconomic stabilization beyond monetary policy. Basically, is that uh, the ECB uh, cannot and should not be the only game in town in macro a stabilization policy. I think that's a very important debate for the future as well, not only for the past. And basically the conclusion is what we know, is that we urgently need to complete uh, our institutional framework. Urgently, that's the term. And that's what the message of Mario before. Now on the mandate, I, will, I think I have 17 slides, so I will go relatively quickly on them. No, no, I will go, it's, it's not too difficult. On the, man, on the mandate, on the mandate, colleagues, <laughs> former colleagues, and, and, and on, the, on the mandate, on the mandate, uh, I think what Mario was saying, I, I fully uh, agree, it's important to say, monetary union was a response to monetary disorders that were threatening the single market. And there were big differences in inflation history across the countries. I think if you look at the first 10 years at least, you don't understand what happened if you start from that. And you, when you see on the left, you see the inflation HICP, you know, you came from an average 4% to uh, below 1%, you know, in, in 99. But you also see the consensus uh, projections of economists. You also come from a bit above 3% to something slightly below 2%, you know, always through the, through the period. You see that the dotted black lines show a little bit this, this shift. So we came from this period where there were, of course, uh, inflationary uh, problems uh, in different countries. Price stability has been defined as headline inflation below 2%, achieved in the medium term. Mario said that. This means that the central bank can look through supply shocks. I read the introductory statements um, from 99 until now, but I was, uh, with hindsight, sometimes surprised that uh, the extent to which the introductory statements is worried about the second round effects due to higher oil prices. And that when you read the introductory statements, you find the concerns about second round effect up to 2012 even, uh, within 2011, but also up to 2012. I will comment a little bit later uh, on this. But still you find this, this old you know, pattern that we had seen uh, before the monetary union, where oil shock usually had profound second round effect, for which you know, we had uh, in the ECB very much to uh, react very strongly. But that, that mindset, and this is my point, the mindset went through well into the crisis, you know, uh, and in 11. I will illustrate that a bit later. The clarification of the strategy in 2003 followed the end of the dot-com bubble when headline inflation fell to very low levels, you see there um, on, on the chart. Concerns were expressed regarding the asymmetry of the definition of price stability, so it's not new. Uh, uh, each rate between 0 and 2% could be qualified as price stability. So price stability could be 
2 could be 0, and what is above 2% would not be compatible with price stability. That's why in that context, uh, there was a clarification, and uh, it seems that this clarification is not enough because Mario again today clarified again you know, this, uh, uh, the fact that it's not uh, asymmetrical, uh, asymmetrical, so that was repeated again and again. But still, I mean, this is still, still very present in the minds of uh, par market participants in general. The clarification, uh, and there was also the issue of the zero low bound at that time. Otmar, uh, you, 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 you can testify on this. The clarification meant that the objective was an inflation below but cl close to 2% in the medium term. Uh, and basically, the idea was that if you would define your objective that way, the probability of hitting the zero low bound would be very small which was not, of course, what happened later, but the probability was considered as very small. The other thing was that the relative price adjustment, if you would follow that, that objective, would be much easier, of course, and that would be sufficient for the relative price adjustments within the monetary union. So that's for my first, my first point on the definition. The second point, uh, which I found personally very interesting, this very simple graph, you draw a 2% trend, price level, and then you look at uh, consumer prices, headline inflation, and uh, compared to the 2% trend, and you see that we are more or less, we're more or less up to the sovereign debt crisis. Not to the global financial crisis, but to the sovereign debt crisis, you're all more or less uh, you know, uh, up to the trend, a little bit above even the trend. Then you have a plateau with the sovereign debt crisis, the evolution of the price level, and then especially with the um, very accommodative monetary policy that was followed after 2015, basically, you see again a recoupling, you know, and the trend, you get closer to the trend again of 2%, but you are below, below, as you know, the trend. You are not yet there. But you see that over a long period of time, you were, so that's the first observation. The other point that was in Mario's speech as well is that when you look at the core inflation, the core inflation has been uh, trending much weaker than the headline inflation, uh, and you see the big gap, you know, now that you have between uh, core inflation, supposed to represent more the underlying price pressures than the headline inflation. The reason, of course, for that has been that uh, we had uh, energy prices going up uh, as a trend also. And you, you can, here it's not the price level, it, this is the rate of increase of prices. But if you see the, the light, the light, uh, the light um, uh, curves there, you can see the energy inflation. And uh, the blue, the light blue uh, curve shows the core inflation. And what is very remarkable in, uh, in that sort of graph is that you, you don't see signs of second round effect if you look at that. So headline inflation can be kept more or less at 2%, even a little bit above 2% for a while before the crisis. Uh, but what you see is that when uh, oil prices increased, you see sometimes core inflation going down. And that was also illustrated in Mario's presentation when you look at the negative correlation actually between uh, headline inflation and core inflation. Headline inflation goes up be because of oil prices and uh, core inflation is pushed down. From that you can, you can of course conclude uh, tentatively that uh, policy has been very successful uh, because uh, basically uh, agents seem to internalize the reaction function of the central bank which was Olivier at that time when you were, you know, the wheel uh, and the dog that didn't bark at that time, where you see the shift to a more targeting, inflation targeting regime brought credibility to the central bank, and that was internalized by markets. Not necessarily the central bank had to act, but the markets would internalize that reaction function. So that's one interpretation. I was looking a little bit further. I think that's good evidence that this is correct. There is some evidence at some points, for example, when you see the core goes down when inflation goes up, headline inflation goes up. We, there are other factors, like the Hartz reform in Germany, that could have pushed also the core inflation down via services, for example, where wages uh, take a very big part. So I think the evidence is probably yes, that uh, the reaction function, which was quite tough you know, in the definition, as was said before, but which was necessary given from where we came, uh, that... Uh, the uh, markets start to internalize that in their behavior. But I think we should also look at other factors. When I say that, is also when you see the, the light blue line, you see, of course, the fluctuation of the core inflation, but you also see a sort of declining trend in the core inflation over the years. So there are cyclical movements, more or less in line with oil prices, uh, as usual, 
But there's a sort of trend, trend down, maybe due to China, maybe due to a number of factors that are still very difficult to understand today. So that's the one. The monetary, and now I go into the second pillar. Mario, we, you didn't really speak about the second pillar. Or I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't really I didn't yet get it, I think. Uh, so I, I think I, I complement what, what Mario uh, was saying. Monetary policy deliberations were and are still, and are still, uh, informed by two complementary analyses, the monetary pillar and the economic pillar. The 2003 clarification gave a prominent role to the economic pillar, but still recognizing that a specific focus on uh, money and credit would give additional signals on longer-term risk to price stability in the monetarist uh, tradition, of course. So there were two uh, pillars, and this is still the case today. Uh, where the two uh, information sets are cross-checked in the introductory statements for what they signal for price stability. In my conclusion, I would say I, I, I really think this should be a little bit looked back again about this cross-check, Mario, when we have in the introductory space this cross-check. We always repeat a little bit, a cross-check confirms you know, the economic analysis. Uh, I thought it would maybe the time for Philip, where, Philip you're there, it will be maybe the time to reflect a little bit about this. Uh, <laughs> because I had a little bit this problem. It doesn't mean there is not useful information. Don't misunderstand me on this. Uh, so here on, on this cross-check for wet signals for price stability, so in the run-up, and you can see it on the graph, uh, to the global financial crisis, money and credit signal upside risk, upside risk to price stability, as did the economic analysis. But, and that's maybe for you, Marcus, when, when you intervene, the money and credit view was not conceived as a financial stability pillar. You came many years ago already uh, with that point, which I think is a very relevant point. But what we learned basically from this is the absence of a proper macroprudential framework was one of the important weaknesses of the pre-crisis institutional framework. And I think this had been to some extent, I mean, uh, addressed. Now it has to be tested for the future, but I think there has been a response to that. Over time, over time, and that's important, uh, Otmar, also, uh, the money and credit view increasingly focused on the transmission of monetary policy via the banking sector. Extensive work by the staff, I can testify, has been done during the financial crisis to understand the pass-through of non-standard measures via the banking sector to the lending conditions. Have been, uh, thanks also to the colleagues from the Governing Council, the staff had access to uh, Balance, very detailed balance sheets of uh, banks, and we can, we can, the staff can, I mean, for me it's the past, but the bank, we can, the, the staff can, <laughs> difficult to adjust, the, the staff can trace, can trace the money. So when you go for Teltro as one of the measures, you know bank for bank what they did and what is the pricing that they apply to the different facilities you do. So that's what was extremely important uh, in our deliberation, is it efficient, not efficient? We could make, for example, cluster the banks between vulnerable, the banks that came to, uh, to the Teltros, the banks with strong capital, uh, uh, capital base, you know, and uh, the weaker banks, and we could see a little bit how the monetary policy transmission was working. So that work, is, I, th I think, has been extremely important. Massimo uh, team has worked a lot on this, and I, I think this is one of the best, uh, I think, achievements. Uh, that we had in terms of uh, understanding the transmission mechanism. So the pass-through, um, so we could trace the money. The, the next one is, uh, well, it's getting worse now, is the global financial uh, crisis marked a dramatic change, of course, in the policy environment. In the early phase of the crisis, it was felt that tensions on the interbanking market and the short-term funding markets could largely be addressed with liquidity management tools. I think that's something to reflect and to pause a little bit on this. The conduct of monetary policy focused on setting policy rates for achieving price stability, on one hand, and market operation focused at ensure uh, that market turbulences would not impair the transmission of the policy rates to the economy. It was a uh, separate, separation principle uh, where you give liquidity to the banks, you facilitate an orderly deleveraging of the banks, so you know they can, they're not forced to sell. And uh, by doing that, you hope that there will be no real effect on the economy, basically. That was basically the principle, so the stance could continue. Uh, and uh, 
those operations acted as a complement to conventional interest rate policy, not as a substitute. Also, during the sovereign debt crisis, the sovereign bond purchase program, the SMP, was to ensure death and liquidity in the sovereign bond market of distressed countries and restore an appropriate functioning of the monetary transmission mechanism. This was not designed to alter the stance of monetary policy. And to signal this, well, credibly or not, but to signal this, the SMP purchases were sterilized. So you see that separation principle. Provide liquidity, but the stance can be separated by the issue. The tightening of monetary policy in July 2008 and April, July 2011, in parallel with continued abundant liquidity provision, have been controversial. So I, I will uh, give you a little comment on this. I look at, in particular, to the introductory statements of 2011, and the introductory uh, statement uh, mention uh, upside risk to price stability related to the sharp oil price increases and the risk of second round effect at that time. Inflation was 2.7% when rates were increased in July. But I think it's, it's, it's uh, important to see that it was in the tradition of, you know, when we formed the monetary union, we had this experience of second round effect. Wages were also increasing at relatively high levels at that time. So that was taken into consideration, one point. The other point was there was also a reference to liquidity overhang, which came from the second pillar information. While money supply, as you could see in the previous graph, was slowing down very sharply, uh, there was this concept that there was a sort of liquidity overhang that could feed you know, in, into inflationary pressures and support you know, sort of second round effect on inflation. There was also in these introductory uh, statements that uh, the inflation risk related to increases in indirect taxes and administrative prices uh, were you know, material. Uh, the other point, which was the impact of the race that you can see here, market race that you can see, because there on the yellow, you see the spread government bonds, the weighted average of government bonds compared to the Bund. That aspect was not balanced, to my view. Jean-Claude, we, we can discuss that, because I don't want to rewrite history, but it, it wants to show it was a little bit lacking the two-handed approach, because the impact on financial conditions of that severe tightening on the bond market that you can see from the yellow line, in spite of the SMP, uh, and Mario, you see the, the, the vertical dotted line <coughs> came, came just after the peak there. So that was one of the aspects. And the second was also, uh, I call it later, the sort of catch-22 problem, <coughs> where countries were somehow forced to, for austerity, to have a tight, tighter budget, but on the other hand, you you know, you also had uh, macro consequences you know, on the economy of this uh, tightening of policy. So that balance, to my view, was not sufficiently taken into account. And so the result of that was basically a severe tightening of financial conditions in general in 11. That was quickly reversed in, in August uh, 2011. Uh, but at that time, I think we were a little bit the, uh, the, 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 the other part. And especially I thought the fiscal policy, I thought about the presentation of Olivier also of yesterday evening, the consequence of the, financial, uh, tight, the fiscal tightening were not sufficiently taken into account in, in the picture, I think, at that time. It was quickly reversed, one would say, but still. A new phase of monetary easing, as I said, started in August 2011, uh, with also additional liquidity provision measures. This is the reactivation of the SMP to include Italy and Spain, LTRO, LTRO, VLTRO. This was not sufficient to stabilize financial markets. A number of member states were caught in an adverse uh, feedback loop. Risk premium price into government yields of a few countries reflected increasing probabilities that those countries would leave the euro, as you know. Now comes the whatever it takes. Uh, the whatever it takes follows the European Summit of June 2012, which decided on a number of institutional reforms uh, to the financial budget economic uh, policy framework of the monetary union, and notably the establishment of the main elements of a European banking union, making explicit reference to the need of, for breaking the sovereign bank nexus. Already before, it was agreed to put in place the ESM by October 2012. In July 12, there was the speech of Mario. In August 2, you remember Mario when you came back to the ECB, and then we had the governing council. We announced that it would introduce the OMT program, as you explained. Now, uh, the, the impact, as you can see in the different graphs and also here, was uh, substantial. 
I think it shows you, it shows you uh, that uh, you cannot speak about uh, stabilization policy in general or even stopping a panic with the whatever it take without a strong backing you know, from uh, politicians uh, deciding to send signals about what should be done in the unions. I was imagining if Mario would have come with uh, whatever it takes, with anything about the banking union, nothing, it would have been probably much more difficult. It's very speculative. But the timing of that communication uh, was key, because when you come with these sort of words, you have to convince market. You have to be credible. So when people say, ah, you should have come early, or you should, the timing, I think the timing was very well chosen. And it was also because you know, uh, not many weeks after this uh, summit, uh, there was a ground there uh, that the institutional weaknesses would be addressed and there was the right timing to send a strong signal that under these conditions you would do whatever it takes. And then came the OMT with concrete measures that came after. <coughs> now, unfortunately, with all these episodes, downside risk to uh, price stability were increasingly apparent. So here you have information derived from the option inflation option prices. And this in a context where interest rates were close to zero. So this, this we know. So three sets of measures were designed and uh, progressively structured. So there was a sequence. You start with negative rates and other things are introduced. Uh, but at some point, we, we, we started to structure all these different measures in a comprehensive plan. Uh, we said it's a complex plan, uh, a set of measures, uh, which are the, the way we structured this was in order to reach max, maximum effectiveness. So we talked about a complex package of mutually reinforcing measures. I can demonstrate that, but I know not that it's really time. But all these measures were interacting and being amplified. So each measure in isolation would have an impact, but putting them together in a certain way would maximize the effect on the financial conditions in general. So they are listed there. It's basically ne negative rates and communication about future short-term rates, basically, for forward guidance, asset purchases uh, program and forward guidance, and uh, the Teltro. From the, I think, in, in, in uh, well, also what Mario was saying, the, 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 inter the zero lower bound story. When we, we went negative in June 2014, in June 2014, the governing council thought that it was very important to signal that the lower bound for interest rates was not zero. Mario said it, I think, very nicely in his speech, was not zero. By keeping the expectation that rates could go further down, and this was explicitly said in our guidance, you would avoid sort of liquidity trap situation. You know, if you think about the world being divided, you know, in the long-term investors, pension funds, and others, the obliged buyers, and the other composed of traders, these people would buy bonds, you know, at uh, very high prices if they think rates could go even, rates could go even lower. So keeping that expectation present was very important to just keep that market alive and pushing, you know, uh, the rates uh, down. So that was very, it was very effective when you look at the curve, you know, the option implied density is a three-month OES rates in 12 months' time. And you see before, uh, in January 2013, and you see the September 2014, how the curve has moved, it not only uh, it, the average, the expectation, the first moment has moved to the left, but the dispersion has been very much concentrated also to the left. So that led to a substantial uh, easing of financial conditions in general, uh, basically on the short to the medium term of the market, but not only. It spread even beyond that to the long end of the bond market. As you can see, the difference between the U.S. long-term rates and the European rates the euro area rates uh, after the uh, forward guidance on rates. So at the time of the taper tantrum, we had a disconnect between the US rates and the European rate, which also helped very much in keeping financial conditions very accommodative. On the balance sheet, um, the use of the balance sheet capacity in terms of size and composition, uh, I think we did it in the ECB in a very bold way. This was a fundamental change from the way monetary policy was traditionally conducted, from demand-driven creation of central bank reserves to supply-driven. In my mind, I'm not, I'm not talking for my colleagues necessarily here, but for, in my mind, what tr triggered that reflection of using the balance sheet capacity, in my, in my mind, was when the bank started to reimburse the term liquidity facilities that we provided, the TELTRO, the VLTRO that we provided. You can see on the graph the first peak on the balance sheet, and then it goes down after 2013, it was typically a case of fallacy of composition because the banks start to reimburse, which made sense from a micro point of view. So they were reducing the dependence of central bank liquidity at that time, but they were doing that basically by cutting on credit. 
And so collectively, of course, it would have macro impact, which was not good, of course, and so that sort of fallacy of composition. And that's where uh, we started to communicate in a careful way, I admit, uh, in the ECB, in the introductory statement about the balance sheet. And the words, if you look at that, it's very interesting. It was, you know, it's slowly balance sheet, balance sheet, or ECB. And at what point? It was December 2014, uh, where we said uh, in the introductory statement uh, that uh, we, the, the balance sheet, uh, given the, the, the programs we had, like the covered bond purchase program and the Teltros at that time, will have a sizable impact of our balance sheet, which was intended, intended to move Towards, intended to move towards the dimension it had reached at the beginning of uh, 2012. You can see on the graph uh, where we are today, the blue is uh, much higher. Uh, at that time, we communicated that uh, we intended to bring the balance sheet uh, and this create excess liquidity, which put an uh, exert a pressure on the short term uh, curve, on the more short to medium term of the curve. So that, that you see you see also the excess liquidity, the, the dark line that you see fell very much when the banks reimbursed the liquidity, and that led to some volatility on the short-term uh, money market, of course, and then we, we send this message, and then we start to purchase uh, government bonds. This was uncharted territory, so that's the next point. Uh, staff work, I go back to the staff work, was very important in assessing the impact of such program on financial conditions in general. So we referred very much Jean-Claude, and that's also new compared to the previous period. Very often we mention financial conditions. And the financial condition is sort of an aggregate of many market prices, including credit premium, by the way, which we didn't do before in the previous period, because credit premium at that time were more considered sort of market discipline signals. So we, we separate very much in the communication the AAA bond market in you know, the risk-free curve, while later, we start with financial conditions in general, which would incorporate uh, many prices in markets, including credit premium there. So the staff, was very, uh, uh, the, the staff work was very important in understanding, for example, how much duration extraction would be needed for a given impact on the term premium. What about the combined effect of QE and forward guidance on interest rate on portfolio rebalancing? What impact of signaling? Good understanding, this is an important point, good understanding of market sentiment and good communication and disclosure to the markets, what I call usually the two-way street. It's not a question of dominance. It's a two-way street. Uh, was essential. And that's also very often a discussion. Are you dominate? Do we dominate the markets? How does this go? It goes two ways. And uh, our program was, I think, quite successful in a, sense, in a sense that it created the very easy financial conditions that were needed to bring back inflation to our aim. And that you can see... The, the, uh, this is a table that uh, is extracted from the uh, Hartmann and Smets uh, paper. And then you see a table with the description of the instruments. And the, here you see the effectiveness via, on the left, the term structure of OS uh, spot rates. You can see the curve, of course, down. And on the right, you see the impact of uh, credit easing measures, uh, basically the lending conditions from monetary financial institutions and the dispersions within your area. And uh, you see this this big reduction of uh, what we call fragmentation. Although, just for financial conditions, I mean, that's, that's visible. Now, the question is the transmission from financial conditions to wages and prices, and from wages to prices to inflation. That has been, of course, as also was said in, in Mario's uh, presentation, uh, Mario's speech, that was more difficult. But when you look at wage Phillips curve on the left, and on the horizontal, you take a broad measure of labor market underutilization, so that's a sort of U6 uh, measurement, like in the US. Uh, you see, and, and on the vertical, you can see compensation per employee growth. You see, uh, you see a, a relationship, maybe flat, uh, but you see that there's a pass-through from financial conditions to the labor market and to the wages. What has been more puzzling is the transmission, was said before, from wages uh, to uh, inflation. So we look very much in the st with the staff about the, what's happening in the service sector. And we look at, in the services, the parts of services which are the most depending of wages. Most where prices, you know, contend a lot of wages. And even there, you see that uh, the transmission of wages to uh, selling prices is, uh, is not very strong for the time being. So that's why also we come with patience and persistence in the policy, because we see the first stages 
you know, from financial conditions to wages. But wages takes time, and this is the discussion, of course, how long will you do that, and what will be the side effects of these sort of policies, and that's, the, that's where we are uh, still today. Now, more recently, there have been uh, new headwinds related to the external environment, and they have led to renewed expectations of monetary accommodation. I will not uh, repeat what Mario has said just before about this. Now, before of concluding, uh, it is important to stress, this is my almost last slide, uh, that macroeconomic stabilization policy cannot and should not be the sole responsibility of the central bank. The ECB should not be the only game in town. And uh, it's also in the Mario speech, but I thought this graph quite useful to show, is uh, that fiscal policy of a number of countries have been caught in, you know, sort of catch-22 situation. But the result was a significant pro-cyclical tightening of the fiscal stance of the union as a whole, which made the task of the central bank very difficult. So if you see the, the, quadrant, uh, the, the quadrant on the top left, uh, you can see the pro-cyclical tightening 2010-11, and especially 2012-13, and then 14-15, and then the situation normalizes there. But that has been, as in the, 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 the Mario speech, has been a substantial tightening of fiscal policy at the time. Let's not forget also that in a lot of these periods, you had also a very sharp increase of, of spreads on financial markets in general for a number of countries. Uh, so that was the situation at that time. So, I mean, we draw the lesson of all this. The, uh, that, so that's one issue, so uh, fiscal policy. The second, I think, is probably one of the, for me, one of the most important, is stabilization policy in the monetary union needs to be supported by a strong institution. I think also Olivier came yesterday with more labor market sort of institution. That was one of the points. We have this, I think, this strong institutional setting for monetary policy, but we don't have that for other policies. I think that's obvious. A lot of progress has have been achieved during the bank sovereign debt crisis, banking union and crisis management, but this is still unfinished work. There are very different visions, and that's also, Marcus, you will come with that. There are still very uh, different visions across countries of what a proper institutional setting should be. You will come with that, and if you ask me, I mean, what is the most worrisome aspect is indeed that. There are fundamental differences about what is the vision of, yes, we are ready to, you know, to address some of the institutional weakness, but big divergences how to do and what to do and in what time you should do that. So in the concluding remarks, I, I, I must confess I drafted them, I think, very carefully. So I'm, I'm out of the ECB, but I'm, you know, it's two weeks ago, so, uh, so I'm a bit uh, careful. So the first point is that monetary policy framework has served us well. I think it's true. Uh, the ECB could... <laughs> I'm, I, I say I'm in between, I'm in between. So the monetary policy framework has served as well. Yeah, I think it's true. Yeah, I think it's true. The ECB could act in difficult circumstances against both upside and downside risk. And I'm, I must say, from my experience, eight years in the 20 years, I mean, the governing council has been a very well-functioning body. And I always say it's quite normal that you have diversity, of, and it should be, of opinions within the governing council. And at one point, you decide. And that's what the council could do. There have been three presidents, uh, and uh, there is a lot of continuity in that institution. I think that's important to say and to remember all over the, the 20 years of the period. So that's the first remark. The second remark, clarifying the strategy further, because I think Mario did it today also again and again, further. Uh, could support monetary policy making in an environment characterized by a persistently lower natural rate. Because that's very often the question we get. If there is a new shock, what do you do? You know, what do you do? What is your strategy? And there are different opinions on this. So at some point, uh, further clarification, I think, will be useful. The third one is that the quantitative definition of price stability was instrumental in establishing credibility in the first decade. But its asymmetric formulation may lead to misperception in a low uh, inflation environment. And we heard also the president uh, saying you know, about the symmetry around the below but close to 2%, which I think is, again, you know, a message which is important to, to pass. The third one is that with the passage of time, the role of the monetary pillar has evolved, as it should, requiring a clarification of the role of the cross-checking. I really <laughs> insist very much on this in policy deliberations. This also raises the question of the role of financial stability consideration and the macroprudential toolkit, because now we have that additional tool, toolbox, which is not, of course, as you know, it's not in the full hands of the central bank. We have 
uh, say in some of the parts of the macroprudential tools, but how would that articulate you know, with the monetary policy making? And uh, I think that's something we should reflect you know, more for the future. And I, I, I know, Marcus, you came some years ago already with that, but I think that's an important point. The last one is, uh, is uh, an open door, maybe, but uh, we have to say it. Uh, European political leaders should urgently address remaining institutional weaknesses, et cetera, et cetera. In this respect, the role of fiscal policy in macro stabilization uh, has to be enhanced. I think that also I agree with that, that the message which was given by the president. But I think it's something that we have to. The question is, uh, and I, I'm finished with that, the question is indeed, what is a bit very worrisome is the different sort of visions about you know, what is a proper institutional setting in the area. And I think that it's about time that we have more clarity. But that's for the policymakers. I mean, it's not for the central bank, really. Thank you.